Well, uh, Brandon, Jenny, and Leah, I'm sorry, I'm not your Uncle Bill. He was supposed to be here today, and uh, he called me last night at 6.30 and explained to me that uh, he'd had a flat tire. I said, where were you at? He goes, I was on, I think he said, State Road 43, and I said, how fast were you going? He goes, oh, about 64. So what tire, you know, he told me tire had a flat tire, so what tire went out? He goes, one of the front ones. I said, wasn't it kind of hard to steer the, the truck? You know, you got 63,000 pounds behind you, and you're doing 60-some mile an hour, and you get a flat tire. He kind of chuckled. He didn't say anything else. Each and every day, we have peril in front of us. We have it behind us. We have it next to us. Um, you know, Essel and Bertie were just in an accident a few weeks ago, and they were both in the hospital hurt. Poor Reagan got her leg cut off, and she was in the hospital recuperating, and she was finally at home in her apartment when she passed away. And I'm not sure what the circumstances were, but I know it's very hard on the family. Death is constantly around us, and there's nothing we can do about it. That's part of life because of sin. It's real simple. I'm going to tell you something else, too. When Bill called me last night at 6.30 and says, can you do the sermon tomorrow? I said, well, someone's going to have to. So I didn't know what he had planned. He told me he'd sent the information, the text, to, uh, to Leonard Troxell. But when I looked on the, you know, the, for information on the computer and stuff, my email wasn't there. I said, this is great. So what am I going to talk about? Well, duh, it's Easter. I had no idea what Mike was going to sing about. But what he talked about, or what he sang about, it was Simon of, I think it was Kyrie, however you say it, C-Y-R-I-E, and I think that's how you say it. He was a stranger. He and his, his, his sons were believers, but he was a stranger. And uh, the guards just saw him. Jesus had been beaten so badly that he couldn't carry. He, he, he was having hypovolemic shock is what Jesus was in, besides the fact he had the burdens of the world on him. But anyway, let me digress a little bit here. I don't know, a lot of you people know, I went on an honor flight about, oh, six months ago, October, I think it was, and we took 70 World War II vets and some Korean War vets to Washington, D.C. Well, today, there are 200 World War II and Korean War veterans going to uh, D.C. It's the largest group that's gone from the state of Indiana, so that's, that's a big deal. But one of the gentlemen on the, um, on the flight is 102 years old. He's 102 years old. They had him on the radio this week and stuff, and it's amazing. Remember a few weeks ago, Pastor Peterson talked about in 1915, Ellen G. White did a talk, and she talked about there would be people alive in 1915 that would be here today, that would be here when Jesus came back. This gentleman was born, I believe, in 1913. So he was, he's, he's one of these people. There's 300,000 people on this planet that are old enough to, to recognize, you know, represent this age group. But what I want to pass on to you too also today is the people that were involved with Jesus' crucifixion, Pilate, Herod, the Roman soldiers, Caiaphas, Caiaphas, He'll be there, too. There will be a special resurrection for those people. They will see Jesus come. It says so in the Bible. They'll be there. They'll be resurrected, and they'll see they made a mistake. They will see that. In this past week, Indiana has been on every newspaper, show, whatever, cross-country, CNN, MSNBC, Fox, ABC, CBS, as regards to the Religious Freedom Act. It's nothing new. President Clinton signed this in law in, what, 1993? There's 19 states that have similar laws to this. There's 30 states that have laws pertaining to this. But the word I kept hearing this week was religious liberty. Religious liberty. How long have you people in this room heard that word, religious liberty? I've heard that since I was a little kid. This church, the 70 of these people, have been professing religious liberty since... 1844, I'm guessing. So it's not a new message. But I want everyone to realize that this is coming to the forefront now. Why? 
because the times we're living in. There's peril all around us. What was funny is, night before last, Lori and I were watching TV, and Dana Lash lady, she's out of St. Louis, she came on, and she said that she started to spun on these people that lived in Walkerton, Indiana. I said, Walkerton, Indiana? I know where that's at. So we listened to it. And about these man and his daughter, you know the story, hypothetical situation, said, well, we probably wouldn't do that because it's our belief, against our beliefs. At that point in time, something hit home. They're going to be telling us, as Adventists, what we need to do that's against our beliefs. We're Sabbath keepers. It's going to be against the law one day to be a Sabbath keeper. It's going to be against the law. This is nothing new. The spirit of prophecy told us a long time ago, this is what's going to happen. When it happens, it's going to start happening fast. So even though we don't think this really affects us, this law that's been enacted in this state brings us to mind that this isn't what it says. It's not about gays and lesbians. It's not about this, that, and the other. It's about religious freedom, being able to worship the way we believe we should. It's about morals. One of the things I heard about Mike Pence, the governor of this great state, is that he buckled. He compromised himself. He should have said, you know, we passed the law, let the courts decide. Because the outcry was from both sides, from the conservatives, from the liberals, both sides. Well, you know, we've got to try to work together, guys. No, we have to stand up for what's right. Those of us that are willing to compromise our beliefs will be lost. There's no middle ground with God. You're either for him or you're against him. It's black and white. And we have to understand that we're governed by the laws of this country. But more importantly, we're governed by the laws of God. We can't ever compromise our beliefs. We can't. Let me read to you from the Desire of Ages, this chapter 75. I'm going to be doing a little reading here because it's easier than coming up with a sermon in 12 hours. So hopefully this is what God wants me to talk to you guys about. The history of Judas presents the sad ending of a life that might have been honored of God. Had Judas died before his last journey to Jerusalem, he would have been regarded as a man worthy of a place among the 12 and one who would be greatly missed. But we know that's not the case. For 30 pieces of silver, for 30 pieces of silver, well, I've got a piece of silver here somewhere. Yeah, this is um, United States of America, one ounce, 0.99% fine silver. This piece of silver here made 19, no, 2014. It's a Liberty silver coin. Just a coin, pure silver. This one ounce ounce of coin was worth about sixteen dollars fifty cents. On the high side, it was twenty seven dollars one time, but right now it's about sixteen fifty. So thirty pieces of silver at sixteen bucks a piece is four hundred eighty dollars. Thirty pieces of silver. Judas thought he knew more than Jesus. He thought his idea, his plan was better. He truly did. From the bottom of his heart, he thought, you know, the only way the Lord's going to go along with my plan is I've helped kind of convince him to do it. Pontius Pilate didn't want anything to do with Jesus. First of all, the people from the Sanhedrin came in there and woke him up early in the morning. We want, we want this man tried. He's a traitor. Well, what's he done? Well, he's a traitor. He's blasphemed the government. He says he's the king. But Pilate looked at him, and he looked at this man, and he saw more than a man. He saw serenity on his face. He wasn't looking at the face of a criminal. He wasn't looking at the face of a person 
who was defiant, who was guilty. Now, as the proceedings went on, Pontius Pilate did everything he could to say, hey, this guy hasn't done anything. What are his crimes? And they really couldn't come up with anything. They lied. They said that he was treasonous. He was, he was against King Herod. He was against Caesar, the king of Rome. But they were never able to completely convince Pilate. So Pilate says, hey, you know what? You guys, Jews, fall underneath Herod. So why don't you go, and I'll send you to Herod, and, and Herod can take care of you. you know, if you want him crucified, he'll have him crucified. But I, I have no guilt. There's no guilt. I'm not going to do it. So he didn't. He sent him to Herod. And Herod was kind of like, well, well this guy, he's, he's related to John the Baptist, isn't he? Is he John the Baptist resurrected? I just got that guy's head cut off. Oh, I don't know if I want to deal with this guy or not. It kind of scares me. But curiosity got the best of him. So he went on and said, okay, Jesus, come on in here. What have you done? Jesus didn't say anything. He didn't answer him. He didn't talk to him at all. And here's Herod. You know, he's a king. This is, he's a governor of this area. He's in charge. He's given Jesus an opportunity to you know, say something, to save himself. And he, he wouldn't do it. He said, tell you what, I've got some sick people over here. Perform a miracle. Heal them. Make them better. I'll let you go. He wouldn't do it. Jesus would raise the dead. He would heal the sick, those who believed in him, those who needed healing. But he wasn't going to do it to heal himself. He wasn't. Herod got so mad. I mean, he, just, he tried to work with him, but his fear went away. His fear of God went away. But the Spirit was talking to him. Same way it was Pilate. Pilate didn't want to see Jesus that early in the morning. He didn't want to see anybody. He wanted to stay in bed. But as soon as he saw him, the spirit touched him. So, Herod said, you know, I don't see that he's done anything wrong. Send him back to Pilate. So he went back to Pilate. Now, Pilate's wife had had a dream. And she saw who Jesus was. She was terrified. And she wrote her husband in a note. Had it sent by a messenger to him and said, Dear hubby, have nothing to do with this man. My dreams are wearisome. I'm afraid. Get away from this. So, Pilate gave Jesus another chance, you know. Who are you? And the crowd said, he's, you know, king of the Jews. And Jesus more or less said, you know, who they say I am. He never resisted. He never even felt contempt for these people. No revenge, nothing. They stripped him of his clothes. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They had rods and they hit him in the head with this, the rods. The thorns had gone to his, his scalp and he bleed. So Pontius Pilate being the brave person he was, allowed the soldiers to be eaten with Jesus. And we don't know how many lashes he got, but 39 was the number of lashes he should have got. Now, when I looked up a, a scourge, however you say it, it talks about leather whip with uh, balls of lead, Balls of lead here with sheep bones. Then when I looked and read about how it worked, the lead would rip your skin. These barbs would jab your skin, and then the soldiers would pull them back very hard, and it would rip the skin. And just looking at the pictures that I saw, Jesus was, um, had lacerations, he had contusions. He was bleeding tremendously. I smashed my thumb last night working on that, and it wouldn't stop bleeding for the longest time. 
Every time I shake it, blood go everywhere. So there's probably blood all over this thing too. But that was just my thumb. They beat him on his legs. They beat him on his back. I'm sure some of them hit his face. They weren't aiming. They were just swinging the thing. We were hit him and hit him. And as you can see, these guys kind of have a, a mind of their own. They just don't all hit the same place. They scatter. I got back from a run the other night at the firehouse. I came in, a TV was on. Sat down, started putting my report in. Guess what was on TV? The Passion of the Christ. That has to be one of the most bloody, malicious, violent movies I've ever seen. I had to turn it off. I don't know why someone would want to go see that. And they're doing, playing this the week of, of uh, Easter. But what sticks in my mind is Easter isn't about the Easter Bunny. It's not just about family get-togethers. And I don't know why they call Good Friday Good Friday. What was good about Good Friday? They crucified Jesus. Now, the only thing I can get out of it is when I listen to Charles Huggerbrook's song, Listen to the Hammer. Jesus done it willingly. He died knowing that was the only option for us. He willingly took those, those lashes. He willingly took the nails in his hands and his feet. I cannot imagine a more violent way to die than the lashes and then on the cross. Jesus probably couldn't lift that cross up and Simon had to help him because he was in hypovolemic shock. He lost too much blood. It was all he could do to walk. Pilate actually thought that when the people saw this, they would feel pity for Jesus and he wouldn't have to execute him. But he was wrong. Satan in human form and his demons were there in the crowd. Crucify him. Let his blood be on us. That's what they said. They didn't know that that would haunt them for their, the rest of their lives. And, and, and even Satan and his angels that were there, their time's coming too. But that's not what this is all about. I want you to remember the suffering, the pain he went through, but it wasn't the suffering from the physical anguish, it was the mental anguish. For a very brief time, he was separated from his father. He saw your sins and he saw my sins. We're either on God's side or we're on Satan's side. There's no ground in the middle. There's none. There is no ground in the middle. Let's see here. Christ did not yield up his life till he had accomplished the works which he had come to do. And his last parting breath, he exclaimed, it's finished. Until the time that Pilate gave him over to the, the Sanhedrin, he had an opportunity to be saved. Herod, as heinous and terrible a person he was, when he was in the presence of Jesus, he had a chance to be saved still. The thief on the cross, initially, both of them were mocking him. You know, if you are the son of God, do us a favor. Save yourself. And while you're at it, would you mind saving us too? But as the day wore on, he listened to Jesus. He was listening to him pray to his father. He heard him say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Can you imagine that? Trying to even think like that? You've been beaten. You're hanging on a cross. And you still care about those people that have done this to you. 
he expects out of us, though. He has set the standard for each and every one of us. He has. This is our standard. If we want to be Christians, this is what we must do. We must turn the other cheek. We can't give up, but we can't give in. Mary was at the foot of the cross. Now, <clears throat> I'm thinking that John took her away for a while, and I think I remember reading that in Desire of Ages. But Jesus, Jesus had a, he'd been a, he'd been a good son. He, even his brothers at the time didn't believe he was the son of God. They didn't believe that he would be who he was. In his own house, they doubted him. But Mary was given a vision. I don't know if it was when she was with child or when Gabriel told her what was going to happen. But we do know that she was prepared for this. It's still going to be tough for a mom to see her son die this way. But she was prepared. She had to be. Or would have killed her probably the shock. I can't imagine. I don't want to. Tomorrow is Easter. Tomorrow is the day that, that Jesus was resurrected. And the important part here is we have to remember is if we believe on Jesus, that he will forgive our sins, and that he died and was resurrected, I think those are part of the components we as Christians have to um, abide by. But we have to understand what he went through. We will not be spared. I don't know that it would be the, the lashes he took, but Paul took them. He was stoned. He's beaten with a rod. But when we think about what Jesus did for us, this was the only way. There was no other way that we could be saved as sinners. No way. This was it. Satan only wanted to get a little rise out of Jesus. Had Jesus lost his cool, lost his composure, lost his patience, had Jesus done anything to retaliate, he could call legions of angels and say, hey, this is it, we're done, to take him out of all that misery. But then we wouldn't have been saved. He could have done so many different things. He could have stood back and said, hey, I'm out of here. He, he healed the dead. I'm pretty sure that angel that killed, the, what, 20,000 uh, Israelites during the king, uh, reign of King David, he wasn't far away. The one that killed the firstborn, he wasn't far away. The one that helped Gideon, he wasn't far away. But he didn't. He was humble. He was meek. And he was obeying his father's will. So tomorrow when you're having your Easter gatherings, your Easter get-together, remember, we are at the end of time. I'm going to preach this anytime you see me up here in front. I'm going to talk about we are at the end of time. We are at the end of time. Reagan wasn't maybe 40 years old. I know the pastor saw her several times. I talked, I went to visit her two or three times. And um, I think this is a new lease on life for her. I think she really liked the pastor. I think she enjoyed visit, visit, you know, people visiting her stuff. And I don't know what her life was before, but I think she was a believer. I'm not positive, but that's what I think. But she was just 40 years old. We don't know how long we're going to live. None of us do. So whether Jesus comes back today or tomorrow, excuse me, isn't the point I'm making. We're at the end of time because we don't know when our last breath is going to be. None of us do. We have to live today like it is our last day here on earth because it could be. And even though I've said I believe Jesus is going to come in the next few years because of the 1915 um, prophecy that Ellen G. White gave, that doesn't matter either. I've gone to too many funerals or visitations in the past few years. I don't like going to them. I really don't. I spoke at a couple. I don't like doing that either. But as we get older, as time goes on, death is around us constantly. Because of sin, because of the life we lead, the consequences of our actions, 
There's a dozen reasons why people die. But the bottom line is, sin is the culprit because of sin. And I'd ask everyone today, that as you're thinking, you know, you're, you're enjoying Easter meals with family tomorrow, that you just for a second take, just take a moment and think about what Jesus really went through. It's hard to imagine. You know, when Mike got up here, it was, it was very touching. You know, it was a good song. I didn't know he was going to sing about that. I didn't know I was going to talk about Easter. God's in control, isn't he? Sean, that was a good story, too. I like the Easter eggs. And when, uh, I think it was, Lucas said, Jesus, did you say Jesus or God was in the egg? God? God is in the egg. God's everywhere. I said, yeah, you got it right. Well, that wasn't the answer she was looking for, so. But anyway, it was a good story. Keep building your prayers. Keep burning your prayers. Keep Shirley Bowinski's family and Sharon's family in your prayers. Pray for one another. Enjoy Easter tomorrow. But remember, we're at the end of time.